grace and peace to you from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to worship here at Westminster Presbyterian Church. In this Advent season, we, we're here to remember what Jesus has done, that he came to earth to offer us eternal life. He died on the cross to take our sins. He rose from the grave that we might rise with him. And for those of us who know that, we live in a relationship with God. We grow to be more like Jesus so we can go out into this world and share his good news. Around Westminster, we call that know Christ, grow in Christ, and go in Christ together. Welcome. If you're new with us this morning, a special welcome to you. It would be a real Christmas gift to us if you would find in the pews the little blue connection card. Let us know you're here. Put that in the offering later in the service. Or if you have any prayer requests or comments, those are welcome on the connection cards as well. Now, as our prayer of adoration and our call to worship, we're going to light an Advent candle. Lynn, is that you this morning? And Barb, fantastic. Stand a little bit outside the blow of the air conditioner this t today. We're going to try that. <laughs> As we light our Advent candle, we thank you for the peace you give. As we live in your presence, light of the world, shine on us. In a culture of confusion and stress, bring peace to our hearts. To those for whom Christmas is just manic busyness, light of the world, shine through us. In this world of conflict and division, help us to share the peace you give. In our service here today, light of the world, light the, the way. way. We knew this was going to happen.
Before we continue, Wayne, are we good? Fantastic. Let's come to this God and worship with our prayers. Lord, we do come here to worship, to proclaim that you are the God above all. You are the king of the universe and the king of our lives. We come to worship, to offer our lives as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to you, to be not conformed to the ways of this world, but transformed by the renewal of our minds. Lord, enact that truth as we come to your holy word. Help us to understand who you are and who we are, what you have done for us, and what we are to do. We pray in the name of Jesus, the Messiah. Amen. So we are continuing our sermon series, Advent Invasion. In this whole Christmas season, amidst all the, the food and the decorations and the parties and the gifts and more food, we are thankful that Christmas is part of a war. It's part of God's cosmic uh, battle against evil, part of God reclaiming this earth for the kingdom of God. And Christmas was an invasion in that battle, in that war. We read last week how that was announced by the prophet Isaiah, that the Messiah is coming to take his kingdom. Today we'll hear it again in the words of an angel, Gabriel, who came to a young woman in Bethlehem, the woman's name was Mary, and announcing that she is to have a son, listen to what Gabriel says about this Christ child. I'm going to read Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 38. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, the virgin's name was Mary. He came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, how will this be since I'm a virgin? The angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come on you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy the Son of God. Behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Friends, the prophet Isaiah tells us that the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So do you hear what Gabriel's proclaiming about Jesus? He'll be great, the son of the most high God. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, right? He's going to be king, specifically king over the house of Jacob, over the people of God, and he's going to be king forever. His kingdom will have no end. That's something you don't say about human kings, right? Eventually, they die. Eventually, they pass it on. But no, Jesus is going to be king over the house of God forever, house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will have no end. See, this is an invasion of a kingdom. Christmas was God's D-Day. You guys remember D-Day, right? Some of you were alive on June 6, 1944. In 1944, Hitler looked absolutely unstoppable. He had taken over all of continental Europe. You know this from, from history, right? He'd taken over the whole place. America had joined the war late, and we were teaming up with Britain and a couple of other allies, and we wanted to push Hitler back, but we didn't have a single foothold in Europe. And so, on June 6th, 1944, we allies planned the largest naval invasion in human history. 
We, on the same day, at almost exactly the same time, landed beachheads at five places in northern France. It was called D-Day. We landed 156,000 troops on the same day. And as we know from history, all five of those beachheads were successful. And from those beachheads, our troops and supplies could pour into Europe and push Hitler back until we finally won World War II. Now, D-Day was not the start of the war, right? The war had been going for some time, and it was not the end of the war. D-Day was the turning of the tide. It was the beginning of the invasion. Friends, Christmas was God's D-Day. It was the day when He made landfall on earth and claimed, this is my kingdom. Christmas was God's D-Day. Now, as powerful as all of that is, what, when, when Gabriel announces this to Mary, the part that really piques her attention is the very first line, you will conceive in your womb and you will bear a son. Wait, me? Right? At first she asked, now how is this going to be because I'm a virgin, right? Mom explained this thing about birds and bees and how is this whole thing going to work out? But, but I wonder if there's a deeper question here. I wonder if just below that, She's really asking, wait, me? I'm nobody. I'm an ordinary person from an ordinary family. Sure, she had King David somewhere in her family tree, but they're not royalty by any means. Wait, me? That's a very common response when God has a particular task for people to do. You see it all through the Bible. People respond, wait, me? Moses, you know, the burning pitch appears to Moses. Okay, I want you to go to Pharaoh and say, let my people go. Wait, 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 me? I can't go. I have a speech impediment. I can't speak to anybody, let alone the Pharaoh, the most powerful man on the planet. Pick somebody else. That's what Gideon says. The angel appears to Gideon and says, you are a mighty warrior. You're going to raise up an army for God. Wait, me? You've got to be kidding me. I'm from the weakest family in my clan, and I'm the smallest of my brothers, which literally made me the shortest of my brothers. I can't do this. King Saul you know, Samuel had already anointed him. He was going to be the next king. But when it came time to proclaim, hey, you're going to be king, he went and hid. No, no, they're not calling me to this. Or Jeremiah. Jeremiah, he was given the word from the Lord to go speak to the king. He says, God, I'm just a kid. I'm a child. I can't go and speak to the king. Wait, me? Over and over again, people's response is, you've got to be kidding. Surely there's somebody better you could be picking here, God. But friends, this is true for all of us. Yes, Mary, you. Yes, you, Moses. Yes, you, Gideon. Yes, you, Jeremiah. And yes, you. Put your name in there. See, once God's desire is to free all of us, to liberate all of us, to bring his kingdom to all of us, to make our lives to be as he created our lives to be, to make us to be as he created us to be. That's the kingdom of God. And once we join this kingdom of God, then we're part of the invasion force for this invasion. You know, in France, after D-Day, all right, we had claimed our beachheads. We started streaming in, but the American and British armies started collecting, and, and also some French. There were some French army in exile under Charles de Gaulle who came in with us as well. But we started recruiting French citizens to fight alongside us. Did you know this? You know, there was already a French resistance, Uh, who'd been sort of standing against Hitler from the inside. But we were recruiting French citizens along the way. In fact, there's the battle, the Battle of Paris, in which those the French army from exile under de Gaulle and the French resistance and also a lot of ordinary French citizens took back Paris the day before the American army got there. They did it without our help. In fact, right here's a picture. I I want you to see this. It's it's, kind of blurry. Apparently, Getting shot makes it hard to take photographs. But, um, but, but I want you to see there's one guy in a helmet. That's a French army officer u- uniform. The rest of the guys in this shot are ordinary citizens in street clothes taking Paris. This is from the Battle of Paris right here. That's the kind of invasion God is leading. It's an invasion in which as soon as you have been liberated, you are part of the liberating force. As soon as we have discovered the freedom we have in Christ, as soon as we've claimed, yes, I am part of the kingdom of God, then you are part of the invasion. You know, overall, overall, 
over 100,000 French citizens joined American and British and allied forces pushing Hitler back. That's an amazing number. Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. And Jesus said, you are the light of the world. Jesus said, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. This is the kind of invasion Jesus is leading. Wherever there are people dwelling in darkness, we are called to bring light. Now, some people may be thinking, no, wait, wait, can't I be a Christian and just lead kind of a normal life? Do I have to be part of that invasion? Well, no, you can't live a normal life after being a Christian. The word Christian means one like Christ, doesn't it? So, if we are being like Christ, we're living with the character of Christ and we're living with the mission of Christ. If you mean a normal life to be a life that's basically self-centered, a normal life to be a life that's basically about me and my family and my career and my desires and my entertainment, well, no. No, we're part of this invasion for God's kingdom. My life cannot be centered on the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Barnabas at the same time. Which means if my life is centered on the kingdom of Barnabas, I need the Advent invasion in me. And once I recognize the kingdom of God and accept the kingdom of God and enter the kingdom of God, then it's my role. It's my calling to advance the kingdom of God as well, to participate in what God is doing. Now, everyone God calls to salvation, God also calls to mission. I learned this powerfully from a, uh, from a theologian named Karl Barth. He was writing around the time of World War II, a little before and a little after. Um, he was from Switzerland, and he, along with Bonhoeffer, were encouraging people to get involved against Hitler, right? The Europeans, Christians, to stand against Hitler. And Barth said this great line in one of his theology books, everyone in the Bible whom God calls to, sal to salvation, God also calls to mission. Now, that line had a little footnote. And you, I looked up the footnote to see what it might say. I expected him to have some verse that he would quote here. But instead of one verse, it was a three-page long footnote. I have never seen a three-page long footnote in itty bitty little type. And that three-page long footnote outlines every single person in the entire Bible whom God specifically calls to salvation, and every single one of them, God has a particular mission for their life. If you want to do the research, feel free. But this is what Bart has said. Every single person in the Bible whom God has called to salvation, God calls to mission. And that probably applies to us too, right? Once we are part of the kingdom of God, we're part of the invasion. Now, friends, that's kind of amazing. It's kind of amazing because God doesn't really need us. God has legions of angels. In, in, in the book of Revelation, we see uh, images, um, you know, visions of angels in full battle gear fighting against the forces of darkness. In the Christmas story, we see a lot of angels, but they're not fighting. They're announcing. The angels in the Christmas story are announcing, this is what's about to happen. This is what is happening. Announcing to Joseph, announcing to Mary, announcing to shepherds. All the angels do is tell humans. Why? Because God's plan of invasion is not to come conquer with angels bearing swords. God's plan is to invite people into the kingdom of God that we might invite others into the kingdom of God as well. That's God's plan of invasion. That's why Jesus trained disciples. You know, that kind of amazes me if you think about it. Jesus spent so much of his time training disciples. This guy could heal people with a touch, and he did. He could feed thousands of people at a time, and he did. He had the, the charisma to raise up an army and defeat Roman Empire if he'd wanted to. That's what a whole lot of people wanted to happen. They wanted to make him king. But Jesus said, no, no, he's going to spend his time training 12 guys apprenticing them to live like him, to love like him, to think like him, to act like him, to make them Christians, ones like Christ. His plan of invasion was to train people to be like Jesus with his life and his character and his mission. They weren't perfect. Oh my goodness, they weren't perfect, and neither are we. 
But that's the plan of invasion. Think about this. Jesus could heal people, but he never formed a hospital. He could feed people, but he never formed a food bank. Those are great things. He could teach people, but he never formed a school. Those are all good things, ways that we can advance the kingdom of God. But Jesus formed a church because his plan for invasion was training people to be like him, and that's what the church is for, is to make disciples of Jesus Christ, training people to be the forces who are flowing in. Friends, if there's any darkness in the world, the answer is the church. We are to be the forces for the kingdom of God, the invasion force. Now, for some people, that seems pretty big. Oh, my goodness, there's so much hurt in this world. We still have hungry people in this world. We have sick people in this world. We have all kinds of injustice and hurts in this world, and it just seems so big. Do you ever feel that way? Do you ever just flip on the news and think, oh, my goodness, the wrong is just so strong? I could imagine a soldier in World War II feeling the same way, right? Right after D-Day, when we're pushing in in the Battle of the Bulge, I can imagine some soldier thinking, the war is everywhere. There's war here in France. There's war in Russia. There's war in Iwo Jima. There's war in North Africa. There are all these different fronts. It's a whole world war. It's just so big. And if some soldier in that war had said that, his commanding officer would, would shake him and say, look, you don't have to fight on all of those fronts. You just have to fight on yours. Pick your battlefront. Participate in God's kingdom in your battlefront. What is right in front of you? What is your battlefront in this battle for the kingdom of God and this Christmas invasion? Now, every time we use this military language, I have to step back and remind us that, that, that God's invasion is a different kind of invasion. I realize the Bible uses a lot of military language, but we Christians have a sad history of crusades and colonization, so anytime we're talking about military language, we have to step back and say, look, this is a different kind of invasion than a human invasion, right? It's an invasion of God's love, an invasion of God's peace, an invasion of God's righteousness, an invasion of God's justice. What we're yearning for is the kingdom of God, the way the world is meant to be. How can we help it become that through the power of the Spirit? You know, I just read recently a biography of a man named William Wilberforce. Do you guys know William Wilberforce? I'll, I'll be honest, I never heard of this guy before the movie came out in 2007. The movie's called Amazing Grace. I think our library may have a copy. Um, I saw the movie, and I've just read this biography by, by Eric Metaxas. Um, Wilberforce was a British politician uh, 200 years ago. He was an amazing guy, a child prodigy, brilliant. He was elected to parliament at age 24. That's pretty amazing. He was just a rising star and everybody could see it. Now, early in his life, he would have said he was a Christian, but he wasn't living it. He was living for himself. He was living for his own grandeur, for his own glory, and for drinking and women and all that other thing. Until he was in a carriage ride a long-distance carriage ride with a man, who, a friend of his, who talked to him about Jesus. And William Wilberforce realized, you know, God claims my whole life. If God is real, then He is everything, and I need to turn my whole life over to Him. Wilberforce con considered giving up politics and becoming a, a clergyman, but it was John Newton, the guy who wrote this hymn, Amazing Grace, who said, you know, maybe politics is your battlefront. Maybe you are called to this role right now. How can you be part of the kingdom of God right here, right now, where God has placed you? It's a great question. Wilberforce decided that if politics were his battlefront, he was going to have two causes he would fight for. One of them was slavery is evil and it must end. He spent his life crusading against slavery. In 1807, he got a bill passed to make slavery illegal in England, and then for the rest of his life, he pushed for it to become illegal uh, in all the British colonies, the whole slave trade to be ended, and finally, just at the very end of his life, that passed as well. He also said, we need to reform our manners. It's a good British phrase. He's talking about Christian living, discipleship. So he said for his life, he spent his entire life, my battlefront is politics and my causes are to end slavery and advance Christian living. 
That was William Wilberforce's life. What's your battlefront? What's your battlefront? Maybe it's a school. Maybe it's a, your community. Maybe it's a workplace. Maybe it's a network of relationships. Maybe it's a particular cause like ending slavery. What is your battlefront in this life? Now, friends, I have to point out, your front has to be where you are, right? The news recently, not much this week, but recently has been talking about this great caravan of, of migrants who have come from Central America and are camping out on the American-Mexican border. And, and somebody asked me, Barnabas, what do you think about this? Friends, I have to be totally honest. That's not my battlefront. There is nothing I can do about that situation other than pray, right? I can get concerned about it. There are some people who seem to be wanting me concerned about it, some people who seem to be spreading fear and anger, and that's a battlefront I can face. I can't control what happens in that situation, but I can control what happens in my heart. If there are people pushing fear and anger on me, I need to push back against that darkness. So can I focus my mind to think of these, of, of, of these migrants with grace and with love? Can I think of the Border Patrol people with grace and with love? Can I think of the people who do have tough decisions to make? Can I think of them with peace and grace and love? Even the people who are pushing fear and anger on me, can I think of them with grace and love? See, my own heart, that's a battlefront. It's almost always true that whatever our battlefront is, there is an internal and an external battlefront, right? There's something within us that how can I stand for the kingdom of God within me and how can I stand for the kingdom of God on the outside? How can I stand for righteousness and how can I stand for justice? In every battlefront, we need to hold on to that. So I think it's important to stay abreast of the news. I think that's important. That helps our prayer. It's part of being a good citizen. But I don't want to be distracted by things that are not my battlefront. In fact, lately in my life, I've been taking some of my commitments down. I've been reducing some of my commitments to realize I need to focus on the things that really are my battlefront in this life. And my battlefronts really are my family and Westminster. What's your battlefront? Now, I want to ask you, is there anything in your life that's distracting you from your battlefront? Any commitments, maybe they're really good things that are keeping you away from what's truly your front? Or maybe there's some hard things, some really hurtful things that are, that are distracting you, taking all of your focus. Some of you may be thinking, oh my goodness, I have distractions. I have this huge diagnosis right now, and I don't know what to do with it. My relationship is on the rocks right now. My finances are on the rocks. Some of you may be facing some huge things right now in your life. Well, friends, maybe that is your battlefront. I mean, consider that. Maybe that is the place where you can stand for the kingdom of God. That how can I live with a character of love and grace in this situation right now? How can I put my faith in God in this situation right now? What's your battlefront? You know, remember also that whatever your battlefront is, we have an enemy. When Gabriel's telling Mary about his, the kingdom of God, remember he's standing against other kingdoms. We have an enemy. And on this battlefront, let's be really clear who our enemy is. Some years ago, um, I was doing some marriage counseling. A couple came to me for marriage counseling. I ended up referring them to a, to a professional counselor. Um, and then a little, couple months later, I asked, you know, how are things going? Just followed up with them. Um, and they said, you know, it's going a whole lot better. Uh, the, the husband said, it, you know, he, he travels a lot for work, and he says, you know, when I came home, we were often fighting, and I realized we both have this personality that we want to win the argument, and winning the argument was destroying the marriage, right? You can win the battle and lose the war, right? He says, I realized I was treating her as the person I was trying to beat, and instead, we needed to come together and team up against the problem. So the disagreement was our enemy. We are a team against the disagreement. That's brilliant, man. To, to think of, of, instead of thinking of the other person as my adversary, to think of the other person as my teammate against the problem, that's brilliant. You know, I think in a whole lot of life, we think of other people as our adversary, but the truth is, our battle is not against flesh and blood. Our battle against the forces of darkness in this world, 
right? Ephesians chapter 6. You know, if there's someone who's given you a hard time, they are not your enemy. If there's someone who has hurt you or offended you, that person is not your enemy. Your enemy is the one who is whispering in your ear, it's okay to be offended. It's okay to bear a grudge, and they're your enemy. You know, the, the guy I was talking to, he realized, my spouse is not my enemy. The enemy is the one whispering in my ear that my spouse is my enemy. Who's your enemy? In every battlefront, make sure we're advancing God's kingdom and not just my own. Make sure we're standing for God against darkness because we are the light of the world. In one sense, each of us is like Mary. You know, she bore Jesus within her for nine months to bring him into the world. And we who are in faith in Jesus Christ, we bear Christ within us to bring him to the world. Our calling is to say, just like Mary did, I am the servant of God, that it be with me according to God's will. Let's pray. You know, I'm just going to give us an opportunity here for two questions. Lord, give us wisdom. Show us in our life right now, what is our battlefront for each of us? Battlefront or fronts? What do you have in front of us where we can participate in your kingdom mission? And gracious God, show us how. It was a gift to Mary that you let her know what was happening. Sometimes my life flows and I have no idea what's happening. It was a gift to Mary that you told her ahead of time the story that she was a part of. Help us to see the greater story that we are a part of with each passing moment of our lives. Help us to take our role in your kingdom invasion. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Friends, as we run the race that has been set before us. Let us throw aside, set aside anything that hinders us from walking forward in the calling that God has for us, in that battle that God has for us. So let us now together, using uh, the words printed in our order of worship, let us pray our prayer of confession that God would indeed uh, clear us, clean us, Make us worthy for the task ahead of us. Would you pray with me? Lord, this Advent, we need your peace. Forgive us when the busyness of Christmas takes our focus away from you. Lord, this Advent, we need your love. Forgive us when our charity is driven by guilt or we withhold it in greed. Lord, this Advent, we need your joy. Forgive us when we focus on what we lack instead of the blessings you pour upon us. Lord, this Advent, we need your grace. Forgive us when we are more concerned with giving gifts than sharing the gospel. Lord, this Advent, we need you inspiring us, empowering us, transforming us into signs of your advent in this world. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
Let us continue our worship of God in singing hymn number 180, What Child Is This? We will remain seated as we sing all the verses. Would you pray with me? Good and beautiful God, what a wonder it is that you, the God of the universe, would become a child, would become a human being to live among human beings would leave your throne to become one of us. We are truly in awe. We are in awe of you. Holy, good, and beautiful God. God, as we ponder this gift that we call Christmas. Truly, may we bear the message to those around us through the type of gifts that we give, through the way we celebrate the season, through the songs that we sing and the ways that we remember your birth. God, may we be witnesses for you on whatever battlefront 
we are serving. And God, we know too that this Christmas season can be a heightened time for those who are grieving. And so God, for those who are experiencing loneliness, for those who are grieving the loss of a loved one, whether someone who passed away recently or many years ago. God, give us your peace. Give us your comfort. May we see our loss in the light of eternity, in the light of your amazing love for us. God, in this season, too, we pray for those who are homeless, those who are aliens in the land, those who long for freedom, those who long for safety, those who go to bed hungry at night. God, show us individually and continue to show us as your church where and how we can work to end these evils of injustice in our community and in our world. God, we continue to lift up also those who are still uh, homeless or do not have a job if, because of the camp complex fire and other fires in California. We pray for peace. We pray for your people who are serving to bring hope to those communities that have been so horribly devastated. We pray for organizations like Samaritan's Purse who are on the ground, who are serving to bring physical, emotional, and spiritual comfort. Be with all those who are offering care as well. And God, on this day, we thank you for this family of faith called Westminster Presbyterian Church. As we celebrate uh, 60 years this month, God, may we, who started as a church plant in East Medford, um, always remember our history, always remember our calling in this community and in this world. God, you have reached out to us. You became one of us to bring eternal life to us and to this world. And so as your children, we pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <clears throat> Friends, it is a beautiful time of the year that we do have so many opportunities to invite people to special events, to worship services, to other opportunities where they will have the opportunity to hear the gospel. They're already hearing it from you in your relationship with them, but there are other opportunities as well. Uh, one of those opportunities will be this evening with the uh, concert of this evening at seven o'clock. Uh, Christmas music as well as good old-fashioned gospel music. It is a fundraiser that uh, we are hosting to uh, bring donations to those who have experienced such loss in Paradise, California because of the Camp Complex fire. So we invite you to bring uh, friends, come here for some fun and a good time this evening here in the sanctuary at 7 o'clock. 
there is uh, more information in the bulletin too for how you can make those donations to Samaritan's Purse, whether by being here this evening and doing it in person, or you can do it online as well. I mentioned in the prayer, uh, December 1st is, or was, the 60th anniversary of our church's charter. Let me remind you, we were a church plant <laughs> many 60 years ago, my friends, and by God's grace and by um, a lot of hard work by many people over the years, this church is still, I believe, a powerful witness to God's grace and God's love in this community. And so we are just so thankful for that. There is going to be a PowerPoint, a slideshow in the gathering place on the screen that goes back, covers some of the history of the church. Thank you, Terry, and others who helped to put that together. And uh, so uh, uh, just I think we just have much to be thankful for, my friends. And also keep Erin Crowley in prayer this weekend. She is um, on a trip down to San Diego, uh, some fundraising for our church plant in Ashland. So uh, just pray for her encouragement for her, that she will receive uh, words of encouragement, uh, financial support, uh, prayer support, all those things that uh, she is seeking. So keep her in your prayers this weekend as well. Next Sunday will be a little bit different. Uh, we'll have a combined service here in the sanctuary. It's our annual children's pageant. And so, um, yes, both at 9 o'clock and at 10.30. And so we will have that cuteness factor um, throughout the morning. And we never know what's going to happen either. Uh, which of our soldiers is going to, you know... Yeah, anyhow, <laughs> we just don't know, do we? So keep that in mind. There's other announcements in the bulletin for other activities coming up. And so um, we love to worship together and to have fun together as a family. And this season is one way we can do so. I believe that's all the announcements I need to share with you this morning. Other just opportunities for us, again, to know Christ, to grow in Christ, and to go in Christ. And we do it together as a church family. So friends, we also have the opportunity to share of the gifts that we have been given through Jesus Christ. We have been given so much financially. Uh, friends, just the fact we live in the United States here in Southern Oregon, uh, that we had a bed to sleep in last night and that many of us had breakfast before we came. So let us uh, share of our gifts, uh, giving back to God all that belongs to God already. I invite the ushers to come forward.
God, you are so good to us. You are so, so kind to us. You have blessed us with more than we could have imagined. And so, God, we offer these gifts back to you, the giver of these good gifts. Take them and use them to share the good news of this gospel of Jesus Christ. Use it throughout this valley and around our world. We pray this in Jesus' name, and let all God's people say, Amen. 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 Let us close together in our final hymn, number 197, It Came Upon the Midnight Clear. We will sing all the verses. Perhaps you shared a prayer request on the connection card and put it in the offering bag when it came around. We will have a Stephen minister here to pray with you, and Bob would be honored to uh, pray with you for your request or for uh, a loved one, perhaps. And as you go from this place, know that you, yes, you have a mission. I just truly pray that each of us will really reflect on that today this week. God, what is my mission? What is my battlefront? Where am I being called to be your light in this world? We each have it, friends. It's just a matter of, with God's, by God's wisdom and grace, knowing where and what and who that is. So go with the power of Jesus Christ, the love of the Holy Spirit, and grace. God's grace. Amen. Amen.